So is the mic live? Great. Um, so it's a privilege to be here today and particularly follow those first uh, couple of speakers who have really given us a tour de force of what we can and will measure at scale in the not too distant future. Uh, and Lisa and her genius about sequencing the, the topics here um, it has put me in a, a really sweet spot in terms of addressing some of the institutional factors, some of the human factors, and some of the challenges and opportunities that we have when we have this flood of data streaming in on us. So I've actually converged three different talks into one, so fasten your seatbelts, I'm gonna move fairly quickly. So scaling innovation in large institutions is really a different phenomenon than creating a scalable solution direct to consumer. Um, I like to think of where we are today in terms of human cognition and machine uh, learning as uh, being a meshing of human ma and machine, and I created the term diadarity to reflect that, and I'm gonna speak about that. And then I believe that we're living in a multi-platform uh, economy now, uh, and so I created the term plecosystem as a contraction of multi-platform ecosystems, and that's all of those three things play very heavily into how you build, design, deploy, support, train um, uh, innovations in large institutions. So I'm gonna try and mesh all three of those into this single talk. So um, many, many years ago, um, perceptual biologists really focused a lot on uh, visual illusions as probes into the human brain. And here obviously you can see two fish swimming or you can see a woman's face. And there are many clear examples of how you can trick the brain. And uh, this is uh, a fun slide this, uh, that you remember the show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Where I can explain it to you, but I can't comprehend it for you. Either one of these two characters could be making that statement because we do think differently. And part of what I wanted to highlight about this is that in art, as just one example, whether you paint with watercolors or oils or use charcoal or acrylics or whatever, there are constraints of the substrate you're working with in order uh, to define what you can do and what, and what kind of constraints you have. And the same is true of human, uh, humans and machines. So I like to think of uh, some of the big opportunities of where we are in healthcare. Um, the first is looking at root causes of health and wellness and we need to begin to personalize motivation uh, towards individuals because we're all motivated differently. The second is managing runaway costs and physician burnout. Uh, starting with why um, and, and really trying to identify important problems rather than finding a solution and looking for problems. And then meshing thinking in carbon with thinking in silicon. And I'm gonna come back to each of these in a bit. And then in, in a sense, trying to preserve either the necessity or the illusion, depending upon how you think about it, of human autonomy. So a couple of quick survey questions. How many people here have been involved in direct healthcare delivery? Just a show of hands. Okay, how many people have deployed innovations across large institutions? Oh, cool. Um, how many are working on sensors today? Nice, and how many are data scientists? And how many of you data scientists are working on sensor data? Okay, and then developing AI platforms? Cool, okay. So um, what we have um, is a multitude of different platforms that we're working on, and it is the convergence that brings them to the human level at scale. So there's four axes of, of complexity that I like to think about in uh, deploying uh, innovations in large institutions. The first is that large institutions typically are represented by an aggregation and a complex array of silos that don't really have intrinsic coordination. The second is that the human condition is far more complex than any other problem we can try and solve. Uh, the third is that uh, in this multi-platform ecosystem, there's an exponential rate of evolution. And finally, the growing urgency of meshing humans and machines and their interaction into the diadarity and scaling across all four of these independent complexities is both the problem and the opportunity as we begin to take these amazing technologies that we've just heard about and implement them at scale. So firstly, the preeminence of why. Uh, many of you have seen Simon Sinek's uh, um, TED Talk 
on the Golden Circle and why. And it's really important that we understand why we're bringing solutions to market uh, rather than just treating a disease. What is the full impact on the life of an individual? And I think it's uh, how do we tip the scales of the future towards kindness, compassion, and healthy habits in ways where health and happiness will simply be collateral benefits of focusing on those uh, human fundamentals. And an example of that, um, and uh, the brochure that uh, Lisa put out included a reference to Empatica, um, which helps parents know um, when their children may be about to have a seizure in such a way that they can actually sleep at night for the first time uh, by having the comfort of knowing um, that they need to check on their child. So there's, there's, there's a human factor that really needs to be at the forefront of all of our thinking throughout the whole developmental and deployment cycle of these technologies. William, everyone's heard this. William Gibson famously said, the future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed. The point I like to add to this, unevenly distributed, converge, generalized, operationalized, secured, and scaled. And those non-functional requirements really take up more time and money in institutional deployments um, than uh, just bringing things to market. So I like to think of an ec incremental exponential gap, uh, also known as the curse of the visionary, um, where it's really easy for a visionary to see this technology will lead to this outcome and this solution. What is hard to know, if not impossible in many cases, is how long that will take, and that's because of the complexity of the convergence, the generalization, the operationalization, and the scaling. Uh, Niels Bohr, the physicist, famously said, you know, he, he, he looked at particle physics and he said, predicting is a really difficult enterprise, especially when it's about the future. Um, and so I think that this slide uh, illustrates some of the causes of that. So I, I also like to think of the eight different forms of innovation uh, in, in enterprises that are somewhat different than uh, the set that you deal with in direct-to-consumer innovations. So the first is disruption and disintermediation of old tools, jobs, and processes. Second is incremental optimization of people, process, and technology, reducing friction in how we deliver care. The third is spreading local successes, and this is something that's really neglected, because even at an institution like ours, we have hundreds of really cool things happening somewhere in some clinic with a few docs or a few nurses or a few pharmacists that just don't get spread. Uh, there's business model innovation, convergence of technology as an innovation itself, uh, cultural transformation so that you align the incentives with what you want as an outcome with the product or, or technology you're implementing. The last mile um, is really a huge problem in healthcare and machine learning, and that is that there was a study published in the New England Journal 10 years ago showing that almost half of all critical care delivered in a hospital uh, could be criticized as being not up to standard across the healthcare system in the US. So we already have this huge backlog of knowledge that's not adequately implemented, and machine learning promises to bring us an, a, a truly exponential evolution of what is valid knowledge that we should be applying, and yet we don't have the tools in that last mile to integrate it with operations and with all the human factors associated with that. So paying attention to these things is not trivial. And then finally, uh, the evidence-based intelligent triage. So we now can uh, have uh, uh, text messaging with members, email, uh, video visits, chat, uh, chat bots, as well as the traditional face-to-face -face of clinic and urgent care and emergency rooms and hospitals. So how do we know who should go to which type of service? How do we know when someone's in a chat session we should bump them up to a video visit? How do we know someone in a video visit shouldn't call 911 and come straight in the emergency room. So building a whole evidence basis of how we intelligently route people with known past history, known current problems into the right type of encounter is a new generation problem that is landing on our doorstep with a big thud because the evidence basis for doing this is not there yet. We know that half of all physicians in primary care are burned out. We know that patients are really confused with the amount of information they're getting over the web. And we know that addressing an individual patient, so I like to say that uh, patient-centric care is an oxymoron because patients are what doctors call people, so it's fundamentally not person-centric. And I just published a paper a couple months ago about person-centric care, which is where you look at the person in the context of their, their, their work, their family, their community, their neighborhood, and society at large. And it really does make a difference because we are subject to the motivational cues that surround us. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the human condition is a far harder problem to address than almost anything else, and there's a reason for that. And it's called meiosis. 
And in meiosis, there are three successive generations that happen in a matter of minutes and days where you do a mashup of 3.2 billion base pairs. And they're actually deliberate mashups where first you swap whole uh, chromosomal segments at the kinetochores. Then there's the second of independent assortment of the maternal and paternal. And then there's the fusion of the two gametes. And so why is that? Well, obviously, it's a deliberate attempt to create diversity, which provides for resilience um, in the teleologic sense of evolutionary biology. Um, Larry Samar, one of my heroes, and Mike Snyder, another hero, is going to be talking in great detail about the interactions of the genome and the microbiome and so forth. But suffice it to say that the knowledge that we're acquiring about what happens in our gut, where there are more bacteria than there are cells in the body, and there's 100 times as many genes in our microbial uh, ecosystem than there are in the human genome, we're beginning to see patterns in the bacteria in our gut that are tightly correlated with different disease states. So there's no way that the human brain can wrap around the complexity of these. We need to use machine learning to really begin to infer and disambiguate these mountains of data. Um, and the amount of data is exploding. So I like to think of where we are in, in uh, history and the uh, digital exhaust as the exact inverse of the Big Bang of the universe. So 14 billion years ago, all uh, matter and all energy was concentrated in a single point in space and time. And since the Big Bang, it's been expanding throughout the universe at an accelerated, accelerating rate. What's happening with data science is that the data exhaust upon which we can operate is converging into a single point in space and time at an accelerating rate. And so um, with that, it's really important that when we try and address a problem with all these multitude of technologies and apply it into a human context in an enterprise or in a direct-to-consumer situation, that we bring together people uh, from many, many different perspectives to help understand what the true meaning is and what to do with these massive amounts of data. And as a recovering evolutionary biologist, I, I like to think of, of uh, evolutionary metaphors in the tropical rainforest is a good one because it represents one of the most efficient ecosystems at converting solar-based energy into carbon-based life, despite the fact that the nutrients in the soil are very poor. And so the parallel for that in data science and understanding the human condition is what I call the metatopical brain forest. And that reflects the fact that we need to have people from many different disciplines to look at the data. If you give a huge amount of data to a bunch of data scientists who don't have operational knowledge, don't have clinical knowledge, don't have deployment knowledge, um, helping them understand the difference between correlation and causation is virtually impossible unless you have a team that represents um, all of those different aspects. Larry Niven, the sci-fi writer, famously said, the only universal message in science fiction is that there exist minds that think as well as you do, but differently. And so how we bring these people together to look at common problems emerging from different data sets uh, becomes very important. So interdisciplinary collaboration in this space requires technologists, data scientists, uh, users of the systems, operational teams, healthcare and community services, and citizens of the community to all participate so that we're actually solving a problem, A, that's worth solving, and B, that is true um, to uh, the resources that we have and the information that we have. So um, there are a lot of missing links in these teams that are beginning to apply the benefits of machine learning into healthcare, and uh, that's why healthcare is, uh, is sort of an outlier in terms of its slow uptake of the benefits of machine learning. It has to do with the complexity of the problem, and it has to do with the complexity of the solution set with people from many different um, origins. I mentioned I'm converging three different topics, so shifting gears. Um, we're, we're really living in a multi-platform economy now, so there are, there are cell phone, cell phone uh, platforms, there are uh, database platforms, there are service platforms, data platforms, sensor platforms, API platforms, funding platforms, and on. And I've just characterized um, and listed some of the examples of each of these. There are a couple of things that really characterize what I describe as the Plico system, and that is that there's exponential growth in each of the components and platforms. There's synergy and convergence between those platforms. There's data liquidity is critical because if we have 100,000 genomes over here and we've got 100,000 EKGs over here and 100,000 sets of sensor data over here, but they're not linked to the same person, we can't really leverage those data. So the challenge is how do we converge data around single individuals and yet respect all of our values and policies around privacy? 
And then finally, open source communities and APIs accelerate innovation through interoperability by design. And, and as most of you are probably aware, um, HHS is more focused on interoperability than almost anything else today because it really truly does liberate opportunities for convergence and solution and deployment. So these are just some simple examples. Uh, my team uh, on average has over 200 innovations that we're deploying at scale at any point in time and uh, managing uh, through these opportunities uh, requires a pretty heavy discipline around uh, deployment support training and, and continuous quality improvement. Um, so uh, I'll give a few examples towards the end, but these are just some of them that uh, some of the bigger ones. So some of the dilemmas in operationalizing machine learning in large institutions are overcoming acute and chronic pilotitis. So we have dozens of people who are experimenting with vendor A, B, or C um, without a path to scaling. Um, there's the notion of discovering new information versus deploying and operationalizing that knowledge, and that, that truly is, is, is wildly underestimated by people doing a lot of these pilots. Um, there's the notion of how do we maintain high availability and security um, across an increasingly complex infrastructure where we've got tens of millions of lines of code in different systems and all these different technologies that we're bringing forward, just increasing the target service for cyber attacks. And suffice it to say that we get tens of thousands of, of attempted attacks every single day. So this is not a trivial problem and it's not something we can solve, it's something we have to live with. Duke recently did an analysis of one of their very first uh, machine learning uh, findings and operationalizing it. And it took their data science team about a month to generate the new knowledge, but it took $200,000 just, just to implement a single new finding. So. Um, how we manage and optimize uh, against this is a big issue and there's a lot of controversy right now about whether the electronic health records of today are going to be the principal platform of the future because they're so constrained in so many ways or are there going to be external third-party apps or utilities that bring about some of these changes more efficiently and rapidly because that last mile of taking new knowledge and deploying it at scale in an integrated workflow environment is really challenging with any of the electronic health records in the market. There is not a clear winner in terms of how to make that process simple. It's really, really hard. And uh, I think that we're, we are going to see some uh, solutions that reside outside of health records that become core to the healthcare delivery platform. Um, some other key issues is make, uh, making sure that you align your incentive models with the intended outcome. And with all these sensor data coming in and with all the information we have from the genome and the microbiome and the exposome and the socialome, um, how do we find those final common path pathways and biomarkers that are really truly meaningful? Because are we really going to be monitoring 100 parameters continuously on every single person and analyzing all those parameters at scale? Probably not. What we're going to be doing is through the, the, this early work is finding what are some of the key indicators, and Lee Hood has spoken about this brilliantly in systems biology, about how we need to really better understand what are the final common uh, pathways of human biology so we can pay attention to those and then bring those at scale to people in ways that uh, uh, represent uh, reproducible um, sensitivity, specificity, and uh, predictive value uh, for individuals. Um, in addition, we need to pay a lot more attention to uh, uh, motivation, and I like to think of something called the behavioral symphony of wellness, where we respond to those cues around us from multiple different sources, and it is our micro decisions every day, how we eat, how we sleep, how we socialize, how we exercise, that determine our ultimate health. And so getting back to what is the root cause of health and what is the root cause of disease, it's about the micro decisions we each make every day. And it turns out that there's a literature on how each one of us responds to different kinds of motivational cues. Some people really love to be told, this is what you need to do. Other people want to have five options and discuss it with their physician or discuss it with their family. And other people respond really well to humor. And if you don't inject humor into your messaging, um, the, their uptake is lower. So how do we quickly identify what the motivational fingerprint of an indiv individual is and then adapt the message to them in something that's more accessible to them? So, 
Um, there are several uh, startups in this space that are really looking at doing quick surveys of individual motivational profiles so that we all talk about personalized medicine and precision medicine. We really, really more than anything need personalized motivation because we know that we can abort a lot of the obesity, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, cancer, and all forms of dementia that are associated with lifestyle disorders. And the other thing is healthcare is really unique in, in several ways in that we're caught in a vice between the policy paralysis that's ongoing and the co conservative culture of healthcare where we know what we've done in the past and we've avoided killing most people. Um, and uh, it's very difficult to get people to change things when they know what they used to do worked good at, well enough. Um, and so there's kind of a vice between this policy paralysis, uh, hyper-regulated environment, policy paralysis, conservative healthcare culture, and all these exponential technologies. And there's the empathic relationship between the physician and the consumer that's getting crushed in the meantime. So Warner Slack, a physician at Harvard, famously said, any physician who worries that a computer will replace him should be replaced. <laughs> and that is still true today. Um, so restoring empathy in the digital world, how do we uh, secure this in a world where we're being inundated with data and technology? How do we restore this? And we really need to simplify the interaction uh, between care delivery people and those receiving that care. And I think one of the biggest neglected opportunities is how we instill healthy habits in children, how we apply some of the motivational science to children, how we, uh, Frederick Douglass famously said, it is much easier to build uh, strong children than to repair broken men. And I think we are, our allocation of resources towards the end of life, our allocation of resources towards the results of disorders of lifestyle should be redirected in a systematic way towards teaching our children how to live more healthy lifestyles and avoiding the diseases in the first place. So another form of, of uh, innovation I just want to mention is the convergence um, of uh, various technologies into uh, common problems. So chatbots are a good example. Um, uh, with uh, telepathy and chatbots, the virtual care and self-service I mentioned about how do we ensure that we provide the right level of care to the right person at the right time for the right problem. Uh, diabetes is a great example. So about half of all people with type 2 diabetes are actually in really poor control. And they're refractory to every clinical intervention we do. And the most common reason for that, for those half who, who just are not responding, is because they have undiagnosed or undertreated depression. And when you're depressed, you can't really activate your motivation to do what you need to do to manage your diabetes. So um, looking at machine learning uh, about how we can motivate people, what is their motivational profile, how do we sequence um, different modalities of communication, how do we adapt it to their personal behavior um, is a great opportunity for machine learning. And then I mentioned before uh, the uh, seizure detection with Empatica and notification of parents and the peace of mind that comes from that intersection of technology and the social construct um, within a family or household. So I'm gonna shift gears to the, the, the third of topics and, and that is the diodarity. And so um, we're all familiar with uh, Alan Turing's test and Ray Kurzweil's um, vision about the singularity where humans and machines become indistinguishable. And that very first slide I showed about uh, visual illusions, optical illusions, I think reveals, and, and, and the different kinds of substrates for art, reveal that we will never be the same. I don't believe it's possible um, that we can be the same in, in every respect because one of us thinks in carbon and the other thinks in silicon. Um, and uh, so how do we mesh humans and machines and manage their respective biases? So cognitive bias is a big neglected opportunity. So there aren't enough physicians in the room, um, but when I do poll uh, groups of physicians, I ask them how, many's had, how many physicians have had one hour, one hour of instruction on cognitive bias, and a couple of hands might go up out of 100 people. So the science of cognitive bias is a pretty mature science, and yet it's not really taught. The social scientists have documented up, upwards of 200 ways, um, cognitive shortcuts. We know that buying behavior and studying it in primates is pretty much the same as it is in humans. And so this stuff is hardwired, and, and it is a pretty well-known science. And for those in the back, uh, I'll read this. I've heard the rhetoric from both sides. Time to do my own research on the real truth. Search in Google. Literally the first link that agrees with what you already believe. Jackpot. 
Does anybody know what the name for that bias is? Confirmation, confirmation bias, thank you, yes, okay. So confirmation bias, I have seen innumerable examples of confirmation bias result in bad clinical outcomes and in bad technical outcomes. There, I've had three separate system outages in the past four months where one of our many systems went down temporarily. And the team looking at root cause focused on the wrong component in a very complex infrastructure and locked out everything else. And the, every piece of data they looked at was used to confirm the bias that they had about where the problem was. And in all three cases, the delay in res restoring service um, was profound and, and had impact on clinical operations. So this is, this is real stuff. Um, there are five different genres of cognitive bias. There are long lists, 160 uh, specifically identified cognitive biases, and there's confirmation bias right there, the tendency to search for, interpret, focus, and remember information in a way that confirms one's preconceptions. So what's the equivalent of machine bias? Um, there is a great book, if you haven't read it, by Kathy O'Neill, came out a couple years ago, called Weapons of Math Destruction, and she articulates very clearly uh, she's a Harvard mathematician. Um, she uh, articulates the intrinsic bias of machine learning, and there are many. And so there's probably more awareness in the zeitgeist today of machine-based uh, bias than there is of cognitive bias in the human. Is that a problem? It's a huge problem. And my favorite quote from the book is, algorithms are opinions expressed in code. And it's based upon uh, how we look at data, how we do or do not, pay attention to the underlying bias. So common forms of bias in AI, most of you are aware, overfitting, intervention paradox, inappropriate extension from training data sets to a population or a problem that doesn't resemble the data that the machine learning platform was trained on, and many more known and yet unknown forms of bias in the machine learning space. So um, evolutionary bi biology versus evolutionary technology, thinking in carbon versus thinking in silicon, um, we've all heard from Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk that it's an existential threat, and I'm so, I'm so grateful to both of them for calling out these risks. I happen to be optimistic that because we have people like Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking um, calling these issues out, that we have a path forward to pay attention to them. Uh, Elon donated $10 million to MIT for a safety engineering institute with uh, Max Tegmark at MIT to address these issues. There are there are machine learning bias and ethics institutes popping up all over the world. Um, and I'm very encouraged by some of that work. A friend of mine um, is doing her PhD at um, Oxford right now on integrating a Eastern philosophical perspective uh, with a Western philosophical perspective of what some of the consequences are of these biases. And that sounds interesting and intriguing, but when you think about it, the Western, the Western view is all about utilitarian outcomes as opposed to personal and human outcomes, so integrating those two becomes very important. So um, there's a cycle time disparity in uh, adopting some of these uh, technologies and some of these uh, rationalizations of bias. How do we ensure that we don't pass a point of no return? Is there hysteresis in our, in our pathways? And how do we convert our frame of reference from a singularity to a dietarity and move from one of conflict to one of meshing? And I'm almost done. <laughs> and this is, this is the last slide that I just want to speak to. And I, I think this is a huge opportunity that's going to transform how we resolve this issue uh, of meshing and, and paying attention to bias. So we need to have transparency. We need to bring much greater transparency to whoever's making a decision, whether it's a clinician or one of us or an individual patient into what the biases are that are relevant to a particular problem in a particular data set about thinking in carbon and what are, the, what are those same attributes in thinking in silico and how do we surface those differential biases in ways that are accessible to each of us at our different uh, level of understanding about how to do that. How do we embed that into our social context? How do we adapt to variations in the user capacity to do that? And how do we respect that different individuals make different trade-offs with values that are in conflict, which many philosophers spend a lot of time on. So what are the implications for design above and beyond manual overrides? So th that, I believe, is the future of managing this meshing of human and machine. And I am just going to skip to a quote from, this is hanging in Health and Human Services. It's been said that the moral test of government is how that government treats those who are in the dawn of life, the children, those who are in the twilight of life, the elderly, 
and those who are in the shadows of life, the sick, the needy, and the handicapped. And um, I think that all of us in this room have a huge responsibility that we don't pay attention to often enough to ensure that whatever we do is sensitive to the underserved populations, whether it's making sure that the training data sets has data that represent them or that we at least recognize the gap between the training data sets, the associated bias, and applying it to people who are not well represented in those data sets. Thank you very much. Whatever you want. Yeah.